Hello again and welcome viewers to another program of Agriculture on the Move. In today's program, uh, we'll seek to dissect the work program of the Department of Fisheries. For those of you who don't know, the Department of Fisheries is housed in the Ministry of Agriculture, Food Production and Rural Development. With me in, studios, in studio are uh, top brass, I would say, of the Department of Fisheries. And to my immediate right is Mr. Rufus George, who is the Chief Fisheries Officer. Mr. Sion Ferrari, who is a, a Fisheries Officer in the, ministry, in the Department of Fisheries. And Thomas Nelson, who is a Fisheries Biologist. Welcome, gentlemen, to the program. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Before we give you delve into the nitty gritty of the program, just an overview of what you all do in the uh, Department of Fisheries. Mr. George, could you give me your, just your overall responsibility in the department? Okay, um, <clears throat> generally the Department of Fisheries is responsible for the management of the fisheries sector in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. um, some of the main activities undertaken by the Department of Fisheries is we attempt to both regulate, educate, and try and maintain the general sustainability of fi marine resources, fisheries and marine resources. Okay. We currently have three um, divisions within that mm -hmm. minis ministry. Mm -hmm. We have a, mm, the extension unit, mm -hmm. which is responsible for education and information dissemination. Mm -hmm. We have an aquaculture unit, which is responsible for the management and development of inshore or land-based mm. aquaculture. We have a marine management unit, which is more or less responsible, again, for education, um, conservation, and general, I, I would hate to use the word um, regulation, mm. but man, uh, general management, management. Of, 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 of the resources. Okay. Hmm. Mr. Ferrari, I, um, I know you're in charge of the extension unit. Could you give us just an overview of the, the working of that unit? Thank you. The extension unit basically works with people to make life better. Okay. And as the name implies, we extend knowledge. Mm -hmm. But to first do that, we ourselves have to gain that information, gain that knowledge, and then pass it on to the fishing community and other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Because we, do, we act basically as a liaison between the Department of Fisheries and the fishing community and other stakeholders. Okay. So in effect, we work with everybody to make life better. Okay. Mr. Thomas, could you tell us something? Yes. Um, well, as you said, I am a fisheries uh, biologist working directly with the resource management unit. And uh, with a small department, you would find one person doing more or less everything. Mm -hmm. But in terms of um, my direct um, responsibility in the resource management unit, one of the, some of the services that we provide, or some of the activities that we are engaged in is um, conducting, for example, of habitat surveys in the marine environment or marine resources, such as mangroves, coral reefs, seagra seagrass beds, um, etc. Um, the other thing that we do is that we coordinate the collection and analysis of uh, um, resource data, including fish landings data. Okay. And as Mr. George pointed out, um, one of the key uh, activities that we um, undertake in the resource management unit is education, awareness, and sensitization of the general public, um, the resource users, um, other stakeholders within the um, fisheries sector. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's really an array of uh, um, activities and services 
um, within the fisheries sector. Okay. We while, you, while you're at it, uh, yes. could you start getting down into the nitty gritty? What are your, the projects now that, uh, that you're emphasizing on now in your section? Right. Very good. Um, I think one of the key projects that the Resource Management Unit and by extension the Department of Fisheries is engaged in is the Marine Aquaculture Project, or the CMOS Project, popularly known as the CMOS Project. Mm -hmm. um, and this project is really looking to improve or develop further the marine aquaculture sector in St. Lucia, with a focus, of course, directly on CMOS. Mm -hmm. In the communities of Prale, um, Opicon, in the south of the island, and Labri, um, these are the traditional communities um, which have been engaged in seamoss uh, um, farming or seamoss culture. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that we are trying to do is really um, provide livelihood opportunities okay. for persons who are interested in seamoss because we would understand that you know, we face an economic um, um, crisis, um, you know, the, the unemployment situation. So we recognize that the CMOS industry provides an opportunity for persons, particularly in the rural communities, and we're talking about young persons, unemployed young persons, we're talking about um, women in the rural communities, and even some of the men as well. But um, it is really a livelihood opportunity to improve the unemployment situation or the livelihood situation. Okay. But just to add here <coughs> on, the, on, on, on the CMOS project, mm -hmm. um, one of the main activities is to try and discourage the, the, the wild harvesting of our traditional CMOS species. Okay. And the introduction of new varieties or species of CMOS will go a long way in trying to, well, not necessarily eradicate, but to help curb that problem. Okay. So here in that project, in as much as it's a light, but we, we're trying to encourage new entrance into that ac activity so uh, to try and alleviate and the that, problem that, that, that new that new variety in terms of increase in output mm -hmm. what is it yes actually the new variety which is eukimia cotton mm -hmm. um, it is known to produce a greater amount of gel and the other good quality about this new variety it has a higher rate of turnover in terms of harvest. Mm -hmm. So you could harvest between 20 and uh, 30 day cycles, whereas mm -hmm. the other variety, it would take about um, six to eight weeks mm -hmm. to harvest. And uh, you know, the, 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 we're also using a, a new method of planting, mm -hmm. which is much cheaper, use of less expensive um, material. Okay, great. Yes. Mr. Ferrari, your, your uh, unit, um, could you give us or highlight some of the main areas that you all are working on? The main areas we are focusing on right now is the FAD development program. And FAD is the acronym for Fish Aggregating Device, which is a, a fish attraction device mm -hmm. to create a food chain. It's a s apparatus that floats on the sea, is anchored in place so that the fishers can find it easy. And since they will not be out there looking for fish and burning huge amounts of um, fuel, fuel mm -hmm. it actually reduces the cost of catching fish. Okay. So if the cost is reduced, and see we catch the same amount of fish, then revenue goes up. So therefore, people can get more money in their pocket. But, but based, based on uh, that uh, operation, uh, I mean, I know it has been there for a little while, and um, you all have seen results. Um, so what's the way forward? Are you all um, establishing more of them out there? Well, the way forward is to reduce the cost, right? make it cheaper, mm -hmm. and also make it last longer, make it more durable. Okay, hold that thought. Uh, we are due for a break. Of course, we are discussing different projects in the Department of Fisheries. We will be right back. Do you know what a GMO is? Okay. It's a genetically modified organism. It's a genetically modified organism. That's absolutely right. 
A GMO is a plant or animal organism which contains genes taken from a different plant or animal to create a set of desired characteristics. For example, a gene taken from a fish and infused in the cellular membrane of a tomato to create a frost-resistant tomato. The technology is designed to improve the quality of agricultural produce for consumption, but its long-term effects are not known. Join the Ministries of Agriculture and Sustainable Development in implementing the National Biosafety Framework, aimed at providing information on GMOs and LMOs in ensuring that they are used, handled, and transported in a manner that is safe to the environment and human health. Well, on the move for, of course, slash fisheries, this uh, program today. Um, Mr. Ferrari, we were talking about the, the fish aggregating device and uh, its impact. Of course, we have agreed that um, because of the successes, you all have gone to you know, get more out there. Uh, could you give us a little more detail? Because I heard about a new, a new project. Currently, we are working towards the formalization of a new project funded by Japanese government. It is called CARIFICO. This is short for Caribbean Fisheries Co-Management mm -hmm. Project. It involves five other OECS countries. So we just one part of it. And it, it focuses on the west coast of St. Lucia from Ancillary to Library. So it, it will encompass Ancillary, Canaries, Soufre, Chosel, and Library. We plan to work together with the fishing community, that is fishers and cooperatives, mm -hmm. to get this project um, implemented so that we can have a truly sustainable mm -hmm. fat fishery. And, and out of that, it can be um, extended to the rest of the island. How, how many, how many um, fads you, 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 you have now in existence? You cannot give an exact figure mm -hmm. because fads are designed to be submerged during strong currents. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they are submerged and they are reported lost only to reappear a couple of weeks. But based on information, recent information, we should have at least 10 fads in the water. Mm -hmm. But not all communities have a fad in water adjacent to them. But that's the goal. The long-term goal is that each district mm -hmm. has a FAD in close proximity, mm -hmm. maybe uh, nine miles away. But it varies. It depends on whether it's East Coast or, or West Coast. So the long-term goal is to maintain a FAD of each district, so a minimum of 10 FADs, but there can be more. We have had up to 15 FADs in the water at one time. Okay. So what, what we're trying to do is to develop a new design such that the fads are cheaper, mm -hmm. but yet more durable. So fishers can benefit from, it, from them longer. Okay. Now, a lot of people believe, well, since it's uh, way out there, nine miles, 10 miles, sometimes 15 miles, that it only benefits um, deep sea going mm -hmm. fishers. But it benefits the whole fishing community in that the near shore fisheries are put under less pressure okay. mm -hmm. right? because you have more people going out. So therefore, those who fish closer to shore can also enjoy the benefits because there'll be less of them, so more for less. So, so there's I, less I, pressure. Am I to believe now that I know when that the fads were introduced, there was some resistance. Um, so is it generally accepted by the fishers now? They have seen results? Most definitely. It, the, the benefit of FAD has been known for quite some time. Like I said, in the, in the beginning, it was seen as a foreign mm -hmm. um, deployment, some foreign country put something there, but now the fishers are quite aware. Mm -hmm. There are still some little problems. Okay. Um, it just stems from a, a kind of territorial mindset okay. that uh, this FAD outside, belongs this community, community belongs to this country. But once a FAD is in the water, yeah. it's there for Open. all and okay. sundry to use. Okay. Right? The only issue that comes up that is a real nagging issue is the conflict between say some recreational fishers or, or sports fishers okay. right who come 
to guarantee their customers a strike. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, by the time the sports fisher leaves uh, base or, or port, mm -hmm. the money mm -hmm. is already paid. They have their money in their pocket already. That's right, that's right. Okay. right? But the fisher starts his engine, he's burning fuel, okay. money is, being, is, is in, in fa on fire already, okay. so to speak, All right. okay. and he has not seen his catch yet. Okay. And yes, he has to compete with somebody who already has money in their pocket. Right. Okay. So we, there, there will be dialogue okay. with, with all stakeholders so that we minimize conflict and maximize benefits. Okay. But just to add here, <coughs> um, I, um, to just to strengthen the point on acceptance, because mm -hmm. there's already good arrangements and partnerships between Fisher, Fisher organizations and the Department of Fisheries right. in col collaborating to, to, towards the FAD program. For example, we have joint funding arrangements. Right. We have joint training and deployment arrangements with the specific Fisher communities okay. and Fisher organizations. Right. So there is a lot of buy-in mm -hmm. within the Fisher communities. And, 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 and I must also hasten to add here, um, a lot of the results are, are known because traditionally during the low fishing season, mm. fish catches, as the name implies, would have been lower. Mm. But because of the, the fads over the years, we've seen quite increase in catches in some of the higher price species. Okay. For example, the larger tuners, some of the bill fishes and that kind of thing. Oh. So there are visible results throughout most of the fishing communities. Okay. Japanese government have been assisting Solution for years. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. could you give us an update as to where we are now with uh, ongoing programs with them or are there any new projects? Okay, traditionally we've gotten a lot of both technical and um, educational support from through the JICA, mm -hmm. which is the Japanese cooperation agencies. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it is quite visible and most of the fishing communities in St. Lucia, you would have seen fisheries infrastructure projects constructed by the government of Japan. Beaufort, Denry, Soufre, Canaries, Ancillary, most, in fact, majority of the fishing communities. Mm -hmm. And there are projects in line, or in the pipeline, if you want to use that phrase, mm -hmm. that we have gotten positive feedback from the Japanese government for further funding, funding. for infrastructure. Um, works. Okay. We, we have had many fisheries officers and fishers who have received training through the Japanese cooperation agencies, both training locally sponsored here, done here, and training in Japan. So we've had ongoing. We have also have technical support where we have um, Japanese fisher experts based in St. Lucia and working with us in order to improve some of the technology that we the fishers engage. Okay. I, I, I must hasten to add also, and that is the kind of misconception that um, some people have the opinion that we just accept things wholesale from foreign agencies. Okay. That is not the case. A lot of the technology, most of the time, is tested and adapted to suit okay. our local conditions mm -hmm. down here. Mm -hmm. So hence the cooperation and the collaboration both at the technical, at the technical level. Mm. I don't think you, I don't want to go into d in, in mm. depth of the the the, the, the Chozel fish landing site, but I know there are problems. Could you just give an overview as to where it's at now and what's the way forward? Mm -hmm. Well, well, I guess again, it's no secret that the port facility in Chozel did not live up to expectations. We've had problems associated with s my sand. sand and the movement of sand and the whole flooding of the pot with sand. And it makes it a little, well, not a little, very difficult for the fishers to moor the vessels both within the pot and to push, particularly when they're off on the fishing expeditions in the morning. We have attempted remedial actions um, with the gen generous assistance, again, from the government of Japan and with technical support from our own local, using local funding. We now have the, the, the project is under review. Um, I am not at liberty to, yes, to, 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 you know, to give up too much information as understand. to where we are with that. Mm -hmm. But I, I must say it is not all gone. It's mm -hmm. not an abandoned project okay. in any way. Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting that we will see some movement in the next, in the, in the coming months okay. as to the way forward. Okay. But there is, there are the, um, varying suggestions and ideas that we are 
studying and validating okay. so we could see some okay. possible movements right. in the coming okay months. training in gen generally and mm -hmm. anybody can come in there but i chatted mm -hmm. with um with mr nelson mm -hmm. in your um department mm -hmm. um how is is training a component of your department in terms of getting your the um, fishers or yes. especially your 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 mm -hmm. um your CMOS farmers yes well. um indeed uh, as um, mr george indicated um, training is usually undertaken both at the department level, training of staff, as well as training of uh, stakeholders. And uh, I will speak to, for example, the, the, the marine aquaculture project or the CMOS project. Um, because we introduced this new species of CMOS what we, and then this new method of planting, what we have done is to train the existing farmers as well as the new and potential farmers in this new technology, um, you know, husbandry practices, possible ways to process the new um, species of CMOS, mm. and uh, ways to dry, really, you know, ways to manage this new species of CMOS and farming of this new species of CMOS. So training definitely is a key component of the work of the Department of Fisheries. Okay, I know Mr. Sparri, you have been involved in a number of training. I know you're mm -hmm. training officials and whatever. Just in a nutshell, give an overview. It's a, it's a continuous thing with fishers, because you must remember that there are new entrants into the fishing industry all the time. And more so in cases where there is um, some economic shocks. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are focusing on getting boat captains certified, mm -hmm. and that will be an uh, internationally recognized certification whereby they can operate a, a motor vessel um, within the waters of St. Lucia, safely that is. Mm -hmm. And in the first instance, they will be training for approximately 100 okay. boat captains but we're talking fishermen mm -hmm. and that will hopefully continue in the future and we encourage as many people to apply okay well hold that thought we're moving a bit faster than furious here eh? yeah um you are watching agriculture in the move of course the slant is fisheries we'll be right back what is biodiversity? When you look at biodiversity, it's all around. I think of biological and I think of diversity. What is biosafety? Um, safety measures for our foods, our products, etc. Biodiversity is the variety of life. Biosafety, on the other hand, involves the management of products of biotechnology, such as GMOs and LMOs. Biosafety seeks to protect St. Lucia's biodiversity. The terms biodiversity and biosafety are not interchangeable. Get familiar with these terms. Observe the biodiversity around you, the changing environment of food production and sustainable growth. Do your part. Visit our websites and stay tuned to this station for more information on the National Biosafety Framework. Welcome back to the program. We are discussing a with the Department of Fisheries, the various um, programs that they're carrying out. And with me, uh, like I said a while ago, some top brass of the, the Department of Fisheries. Um, Mr. Nelson, in terms of training, uh, I, I think it is, you all are very focused in that, in that area. Uh, you want to continue yes. and highlight? Um, one of the other training opportunities, uh, activities that I would want to highlight is that very soon, in fact, in the next few weeks, we'll be undertaking some business skills training for the um, CMOS farmers mm -hmm. um, in uh, Labri, um, Prale, and Opicon, mm -hmm. because we recognize that marketing and uh, the management of CMOS as a business is very important. Mm -hmm. um, the other training opportunity that I would like to highlight, which falls under the Fisher Development Program or project of the Department of Fisheries, is um, training of Kong divers. And why did this training, why is this training necessary? Um, the thing is that we recognize that a number of Kong divers, um, particularly in the north of the island, have been experiencing um, what you call the bends mm -hmm. or the compression sickness. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that has had a, a, a great impact on uh, their life, on their social life. And of course, if they are sick from the bends, they will not be able to go continue. and ply their trade mm. and continue to earn a livelihood. And by extension, it would also affect the, the, their families. Mm -hmm. um, so it is really an issue of safety practices when uh, conducting um, or when diving for conch. Mm -hmm. So the department is really training a number of the conch divers in safety practices when it comes to the diving um, for conch. Okay. And this training is um, focusing, I said, in the north of the island, conch divers in the north of the island, as well as the south of the island. Okay. So we really have two groups of training, and this is currently ongoing. Okay. Yes. There's another aspect I want to um, talk about is the question of the, the sustainability of, of the marine stock. Um, there are lots of um, fishers out there who go for the lobster and the conch itself and the sea urchins and stuff like this. What programs are in place to ensure there, that there is you know, sustainability of that resource for generations to come? Yeah. Mr. George, can you start off the, the ball? OK. Um, we, 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 ha we currently have fisheries regulations. Mm -hmm. um, and it speaks specific to conservation measures. Mm -hmm. um, we have open and closed seasons specific to lobsters, um, turtles. We have had closed areas based on availability of the stock. Mm -hmm. For example, as we speak, the sea urchin, which is traditionally known as sea eggs, mm -hmm. Is currently because the stocks has depleted has depleted so much mm -hmm. that it is currently a fishery that is not open. If I could put it in the layman's okay. term, we have size limits, and when when we when we come talk about lobsters and that kind of thing. But I I, I think the important thing here is for not specifically for fishers alone, but for the general public mm -hmm. to be aware of some of these regulatory arrangements that are in place. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the educational activities that we spoke of earlier mm -hmm. are targeted towards that, that we go to the schools, we have training of the fishers, because it, it is a, 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 a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. For example, if a fisher is not going to get sale for an undersized lobsters, he will not have, he will not be encouraged to target mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. so, so hence the reason for the training to be pitched at all at all, all levels. levels. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the, in, you know, in a very nutshell, some of the, the, the arrangements. In terms of the, the, the regulatory arrangements, I know, Sion, you, uh, I, I was privy to uh, some um, uh, meeting that you all had with the law enforcement enforcers and stuff like this. Tell us a little more about that. Well, this was to develop an enforcement toolkit. Mm -hmm which would bring in all relevant pieces of legislation from wherever they are, whether it is the Fisheries Act, the Fragile Larceny Act, VET, wherever, and put it in one document for ease of reference. Mm -hmm. So we worked with all enforcement agencies, okay. and under the Act, uh, there are authorized officers, mm -hmm. say Customs and Excise, mm -hmm police mm -hmm. and any other um, person designated as an off-right officer by the minister. Mm -hmm. So we worked with, with, with those different agencies, but everybody together so that everybody knows their role mm -hmm. within the, the fisheries sector. Mm -hmm. Because th there was a tendency to say um, that we are enforcing fisheries laws, mm -hmm. but it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the law of the land. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not only for us. Mm -hmm. And it, it removes the, the pressure mm -hmm. or, um, from extension officers to be enforcement officers, mm -hmm. because we are not, mm -hmm. right? Oh. It's a friend and foe kind of, we, we are friends mm -hmm. to, to the fishing community mm -hmm. and not the foe. Mm -hmm. the, the enforcement part is for somebody else to do, but we educate, and that brings in the question of sustainability because that's part of our role also to show that actions has consequences. Because mm -hmm. if you remove too many, 
too early and they have not yet reproduced, mm -hmm. then the future is not too good. Mm -hmm. So that is part of our song right through. Mm -hmm. No matter what we engage in, that kind of message is sent. Okay. So there is always the idea that everything we do must be sustainable. That's why anytime you enter a training session, you will hear the, the phrase best practices, mm -hmm. you know, mess size. Mm -hmm. Always give the organism a chance to reproduce so that you ensure that there are resources for the future and That's for future right. generations. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, just to add in terms of the fishery conservation me uh, measures mm -hmm. that um, Mr. George spoke about, and I think the important thing is why um, are these fishery conservation me measures put in place? Mm -hmm. And as he said, for example, you have size limits, you have marine reserves or areas that are enclosed, you have gear restrictions in terms of the type of gear that you use, the mm -hmm. mesh sizes, um, in terms of some of, there, there are actually some band um, gear. Mm -hmm. For example, you, you, the, the use of dynamite, it's mm -hmm, banned. Mm -hmm. um, the use of charmel net, it's banned. So it is really the importance of, uh, or, or the reasons for having these fishery conservation me measures. And many a times it is really to protect breeding adults. So for example, you would have a size limit mm -hmm. and it is really to protect in some instances, breeding adults mm -hmm. or sometimes juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you would have, we would have closures. Mm -hmm. And as Mr. George pointed out, you have, right now we have an open period for the lobster fishery. Mm -hmm. um, and there are times that we would have a closed period. Mm -hmm. Now during the closed period, these are the, 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 that's the time when lobsters would be breeding, would be making little ones, mm -hmm. so to speak. And it is important to protect these adults that are breeding. Mm -hmm. um, even when we have the open season for lobsters, you have a size limit, okay? So it is important to protect again um, the, you know, certain sections of the population mm -hmm. of, uh, of lobsters. Okay. Um, so, so these things are, are very, very, very crucial okay. for persons okay. to add right. here to. Okay. Yeah, but, but just to add here, mm -hmm. in as much as we have the conservation and management measures mm -hmm. in place, but we have challenges mm -hmm. because monitoring, management, and enforcement yeah. of these measures becomes very challenging, particularly to the Department of Fisheries. Okay. In terms of our capacity, um, staff complement, so we rely a lot on, as Mr. Ferrari indicated, on some of the enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. And I, I speak here a lot maybe to the Marine Police. Mm -hmm. And we have good working collaboration okay. with these agencies. Mm -hmm. But again, they too have their own work programs okay. and other activities that okay. maybe takes more precedence All than right. Marine enforcement. Okay, I'll so I'll that I'll itself I'll is I'll challenging. I'll just stop you here because we are running over time now. Yeah. I think we have exhausted our stay here. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you all gentlemen for coming. I know we just, the tip of the iceberg we touched. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. long down the road we we're going to the more, you know, meaty gritty. Mm -hmm. um, so Mr. George, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Ferrari and Mr. Nelson. Mm -hmm. I want to ensure that um, we are open for more discussion later on and continue the good work. Right. I think you all, need, you all need to be more visible out there. Um, that's one way to start. Okay? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, I wish you all success yeah. in your endeavors. Thanks. So viewers, I would like to thank you for viewing. I uh, just want to, to remember one gentleman, Mr. Dunstan Fontenelle, who has been watching this show every time. And I, I know his, his home is bedridden. So I will say hello to you, continue watching the show. And of course, viewers, we will be here again next time. My name is Philip Sidney saying goodbye and see you. Agriculture on the move. 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 Agriculture on the move.